All right, everyone, welcome to MedPeed's Grand Rounds today. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Justin Roche here to present um, his presentation, No Room for Fear, the Impact of Psychological Safety in Medical Education. Dr. Roche is a native of the Land of Enchantment, that's New Mexico for those who are unfamiliar with the state moniker. He is a husband, a son, a dog parent, and a passionate physician with the Northern Colorado Hospitalist Group and is also an associate professor, professor for um, CU School of Medicine. Rather than enumerating accomplishments and plaudits, and with a nod to the goal of this presentation, Dr. Roche, he prefers Justin, proudly practices in Fort Collins, Colorado, where his clinical and academic interests include diagnostic reasoning, psychological safety, and helping medical students and residents with test wideness and test preparation. And with that, let's welcome Dr. Roche. Angeline, thank you. It's, uh, I would just tell all of you, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. This is intended to be, uh, in a sense, an interactive presentation. So I'm just going to welcome your questions as they come up throughout the presentation. Send them in the chat, or uh, I'll try to provide some breaks so that you can just ask those questions as they come up as well. Just a, a brief uh, thanks as well to Alyssa and to Dr. Stauer uh, for having me here today as well. I'm excited to present on this topic. Um, Alyssa had attended uh, ACP this year where we'd uh, presented uh, a similar presentation. We talked about psychological safety and the role of physician well-being. And so she'd asked if I would be willing to chat uh, with you all via Grand Rounds and talk a little more about psychological safety and medical education. And let's see here. Let's just make sure this is going to go. So. The key objectives for today are to make sure that by the end, we can define psychological safety. I think it's going to be important to describe the impact. And really, as I described it in the title slide, the necessity of psychological safety in facilitating learning. And then I want to make sure that you all have the ability to implement really three key tools uh, in creating micro and macro climates of psychological safety as well. So I think some importance uh, to consider as we preface this discussion is that the lessons learned here are transferable elsewhere in the hospital. A lot of what we're gonna talk about is about building relationships. And uh, some of this is gonna be very germane to the relationships you'll have with colleagues, with consultants, with nurses, with respiratory therapists. And I would even say transferable external to the hospital and personal relationships. I will also just throw out there that I don't think this is soft material. I remember when I was a resident and, you know, every Grand Rounds I went to, I think I wanted this uh, tidy piece of clinical expertise that would somehow broaden my, my clinical knowledge base. And I would say that I think back on my time as a resident, I realized how important it is to think about some of these presentations that really capture an experience that most of us have shared during our training. And so that's what today is really gonna be about. And I'll just specify as well, I have no financial or otherwise uh, disclosures to note to you all. So I wanna take you on a journey and I wanna take you on a journey back to my third year of medical school. Uh, and I wanna preface today's discussion with just a personal narrative. So. My first day in my third year of medical school, uh, I was starting on my OB-GYN rotation, and I started at a small community hospital in my, my native city. And so I met my, my preceptor, and he was very excited, and he said, hey, you know what, there's a, an emergent C-section that's about ready to take place, let's get you in there. And I think he was just very eager for me to be in an immediate climate where I could learn something. So I remember he rushed me back through the, you know, the steel doors into the operating suites and we scrubbed in. It was my first time scrubbing in. And I remember just being thrust into this dark operating theater and someone was waiting there for me and just put this gown on me, like pulled me around, just told me to hold my hands up. They put gloves on and they put the bouffant on and then they just told me to stand in the corner and stay quiet. And so to just keep in mind, you're in this darkened operating theater. I have no rapport with the patient. I haven't met the surgeon who's in there. I have no idea otherwise what I should do. It's my first day of my third year of medical school. So all I realized that I really could do was to try to sit there and think about the different anatomical layers that the surgeon was carefully dissecting in a somewhat urgent fashion, I suppose, for this, this emergency section. And so the only other thing I could think about doing in that moment while I'm sitting there silently, just holding my hands up in the air, like, uh, like somebody like the, the field goal was good 
we'll just count these surgical sponges that the, the obstetrician was using to staunch all the bleeding. And I mean, things are chaotic in there. And I think they're, the anesthesiologist is talking about the blood pressure and you know, the, the obstetrician's urgently trying to recover the neonate in the setting. And I mean, even for me, it was a very tense moment. Now, as I noticed that they're trying to pull out uh, these sponges, it seems to me that after they've recovered the neonate and things are sort of calming down in, in the operating theater, that they've left a, a sponge behind. And I'm fairly confident as they start pulling these back out. And again, this was the only thing I could think to do as a third year medical student was to look at the, try to recount my anatomy and count the surgical sponges. And so it got to a point where they start to close the patient back up. And so again, I'm just sitting in the operating theater. I don't even know if the physician who is suturing the patient back up even knows that I'm there. Um, and so I'm faced with this moment of reconciliation, but like I am the least experienced person in that room. And do I say something based on a hunch that I think I have? I think I'm about 90 to 95% confident, but what if I'm wrong? You know, what if, what if the, the patient hears me and says, well, who is this guy? And what if the, the surgeon just yells at me? And so in that moment, I think I was just paralyzed with fear trying to decide what I was going to do. Now, I think the reason that I felt that way, and maybe you've had a similar moment at some point in your training, is that there is clearly a precedent of fear in medical education. And it's underpinned by some key principles. And we know that students uh, report mistreatment by faculty. And nearly two thirds of students at one point in time in their training have uh, at least perceived a moment of mistreatment by faculty. And I think in a frightening way, an even higher percentage of students have reported an episode of mistreatment by residents. Now, I know, and, and as I've talked with faculty and with residents about this concept before, I mean, sometimes people bring up the notion, well, you know, this is a, an entitled generation of learners, but I mean, this, the data came out in 2014 and even before that, and it hasn't shifted a whole lot even through 2022. And so we know that at least through the eyes of a learner, there have been these moments where they feel like they've been subject to mistreatment. Now we know as well that even if we try to think about that mistreatment as a mechanism to try to teach students, students perceive that as teaching by humiliation. And we're gonna talk about how ineffective this is throughout the course of the presentation, but 83% of students had at least discussed that they'd witnessed teaching by humiliation and 74% had experienced it firsthand. And those are fairly startling numbers. And I think it reflects sort of the culture that a lot of us grew up in as we trained in both medical school and then even sometimes in residency. Now, there is, however, a context for psychological safety or, or maybe the lack thereof in medicine. And, you know, we, I think, are all very familiar with Hippocrates' famous quote of first do no harm. But I think very few of us actually realize that there was more to that quote. We only uh, just co-opt uh, the first, uh, you know, four words or so. But he said, First, do no harm to those you trust, but punish thy enemies with hardened resolve. And even William Osler said, you know, learners should cry in the trenches of medical education. Their intellectual flogging should be brutal and ceaseless, and their role is to be as silent as the wind. Now, I think if you're, you're questioning the veracity of these quotes, well, you're, you're right, that the really accurate historical context is that both of these figures really promoted an idea of psychological safety within medicine. And Hippocrates had mentioned that wherever the art of medicine is loved, there is also a love of humanity. And Osler had really talked about the idea that perhaps no sin so easily besets us as a sense of self-satisfied superiority to others. And I think they understood the key of, in even some tacit ways, establishing a culture of psychological safety, both for the benefit of the patient, but also for those that we we're gonna train. Now, Patney and others had even looked at the subculture of speaking up in operating rooms, similar to the operating theater I was in as a third year medical student. And Patney had discussed that stymieing the ability to speak up can lead to poor patient outcomes. It can compromise team function and training and learning. And she described that the characterization of fear and intimidation in these settings, even though it might not be as similar to the settings that you and I practice in, but it gives insight into how a negative hierarchical culture
can adversely impact patient safety, training, learning, and team function. And this impacts all of us, whether it's our students or for those of us who are faculty, it can lead to poor patient outcomes and it really hinders how we learn. And I think we understand that fear stymies learning. So Peter Brown uh, had characterized the idea that really we want a desirable degree of difficulty, but when that stress level and that fear gets so high, it hinders professional growth and fundamentally holds us back, I think, from achieving our most important successes in learning. And it, it hinders that neuron function. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I think we need to be aware of how the lack of psychological safety and that fear can really impact us in multiple different domains. So now having established that context, I wanna talk about where change starts and to really discuss the role of psychological safety and what psychological safety is. So psychological safety was termed by Amy Edmondson and she's a professor at the Harvard Business School. And back in the 1990s, she had been looking at what constituted uh, a functional uh, effective team from a dysfunctional team. And they're looking at this in mass general. And her hypothesis was that a effective team would make far fewer errors from a dysfunctional team due to team cohesion, the ability to talk openly, et cetera. And so when she studied this, and I guess just a, a question for the audience, how many more errors do you think the dysfunctional team made than the effective team? Like any thoughts? Anyone, yeah, anyone in the room want to shout out any guesses? Or feel free to put anything in the chat for those online. Yeah. 50% more. Okay. Twice as many. Twice, okay. Yeah. I've successfully cultivated an environment where no one wants to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in thinking about this, when Dr. Edmondson studied this, she found that the effective team had 10 times more reported errors. Now this is important because it was reported errors, but this was a rather startling revelation and trying to think about well, an effective team making 10 times the number of errors compared to a dysfunctional team, this was startling and very counterintuitive. And when she actually studied what constituted this effective team's reporting of errors, she just found that the team was more comfortable in actually diagnosing the errors and seeking uh, effectively an ideal of quality improvement. Uh, they were more willing and open to discuss what they needed to do better. Whereas the dysfunctional team, there was this subculture that, of fear that stymied that reporting of errors. And so what Dr. Edmondson found was that these effective teams more oftentimes pursued this idea of failing faster to succeed sooner. And I think that idea is key and again is gonna underpin a lot of what we discuss. So psychological safety in medicine, I think, is in some senses defined as the ability to exercise one's self-efficacy free from the fear of consequences to one's self-image, status, or career. But I think boiled down into a simpler manageable definition, I think for all of us, it's the idea of the freedom to be fallible, but with the support necessary to succeed. And I think if, if we just think about that one more time, and I'll mention that once more, is the freedom to be fallible, but with the support necessary to succeed. And if we just keep in mind this idea and you think about what it was like fundamentally to be a medical student, you know, for when I was a medical student, every rotation you started, you felt this incumbent need to know everything about everything that you're gonna already see on this rotation, but that's obviously impossible. And so you really needed to have that ability to be fallible. I mean, that's why it's medical school. You're learning about all these concepts but you needed that support from your house staff and your faculty to be able to succeed and grow. And so I think holding this tenant in the forefront of our minds is gonna be key. Now, Edmondson had talked about what psychological safety is and is not. And so she's talked about a couple key principles and psychological safety is really about productive conflict. It is about learning and appreciating different perspectives. And additionally, it's about this idea of promoting respect. Now. I think psychological safety is not simply about being nice. Productive conflict is about trying to make sure that you can have uh, a collaborative dialogue uh, when maybe there is a concept that you don't agree about. And so for me, sometimes when I'm talking with my consultants, uh, I will sometimes pause and say, hey, I need a little more clarity about why we want to keep this intraortic bloom pump in, or can you tell me more about why we were thinking about doing this instead? 
these sometimes are learning opportunities for myself as well, but it is about trying to make sure that there is an ability to pause and even ask sometimes, are we doing the right thing? And I really want to understand your frame for why. I think this leans a little bit into this idea of learning and appreciating different perspectives. And Edmondson talks about this as being a don't knower. And she really, uh, I think, embraces this idea of trying to be, be very comfortable with what we don't know, or even trying to just avail ourselves that even if we feel like we're an expert in a certain area, trying to invite that difference of perspectives that someone might have, and even acting as though we don't know the answer. And I think I try to embrace this as well, even when I'm teaching with medical students or with residents, to even try to acknowledge sometimes my own learning edges and not trying to fumble my, fumble my way through uh, a question that someone asks that I don't have an answer to. But also, even sometimes if I really feel like I know a topic well, to even try to just invite the notion that maybe somebody looked at a paper recently that I haven't seen and just allowing myself to say, well, maybe I don't know the answer to this question. What do you know? Even if it's someone who might be more junior than myself. And then additionally, this idea of promotion of respect. And again, this seems like a very tacit, simple principle, but this is not simply seeking politeness for politeness sake. This is really about trying to engender uh, trust and rapport and collaborate to develop a relationship. And sometimes this is about asking, you know, what should I know about? And this could be a topic. What should I know about uh, amyloid induced kidney injury? Or what should I know about you as an individual? I bring up these principles as well, because if you just look at some of these phrases to promote safety, I use a lot of these with nursing staff when I'm on at night. So I, or during the day, but I would say that I cover nights uh, out here in Colorado at a couple different hospitals. And during those moments, things can be incredibly tense if we have a decompensating patient. And sometimes just embracing these phrases really has helped to create uh, a great degree of rapport with a lot of the nurses and staff that I work with, people that I now consider friends. And I think this is key to try to keep in mind that we're all playing on the same team and really tries to, uh, by even just inviting perspectives from the people that I work with, uh, intonates the respect that I have for them. Hey, how can, uh, how can you help in the care of this patient at this point in time? So I would keep these phrases in mind and pocket them as ways to try to create that culture of psychological safety. Now, if psychological safety is so vital, why don't we do a better job of establishing or promoting it? And I think fundamentally from both the perspective of students and then for residents and faculty, it's I think because we worry about ourselves, our self image, the sort of metaphorical rating that someone's gonna give to us. I mean, for the medical student, they're afraid sometimes to speak up because they don't wanna be seen as someone who maybe is challenging authority and who's gonna get a lower evaluation score because of speaking up in some ways or admitting their own ignorance. I think sometimes from the perspective of faculty, sometimes, or even colleagues, we don't want to speak up as much because we value sometimes just being able to call a consultant and not having them fight us over something because we didn't argue with them the last time. But I think it becomes more incumbent upon us to really think about how we can have these promoted or progressive and uh, thoughtful discussions about promoting respect that really engenders that environment of psychological safety. And we'll talk a little more about the devices that we use to achieve that. So let's talk about psychological safety and the facilitation of learning at this point. So I wanna walk you back uh, to that moment in the operating theater. So I'm standing there and I remember I'm just starting to sweat a little bit and thinking about what I should do. You know, my heart's pounding at this point because they're starting to close up progressive other layers of tissue and getting to some of the other fascia. And so finally, my voice just kind of creaks and I say, I, I think. And so the physician looks up, she scans the room and can see this sort of dark figure standing back in the shadows. And she says, what do you say? Who are you? And so my voice kind of creaks again and I tell her that I'm the third year medical student. And again, she had no idea that I was even in there. And tell her, I think you left a lap pad behind. Now, I just remember in that moment, she just glared at me. And I remember that stare, and it seemed like she stared at me for an eternity. And she looked back at the patient. She paused suturing for just a moment. She looked down and was somewhat pensive for a moment, and she looked back up at me. And she said, 
how confident are you? And I said, very confident. And I didn't cite a percentage at that point. And she looks at the scrub nurse and she says, what are my counts? And the scrub nurse says, my counts are right. Like you know, implying that basically I was wrong, that there was no lap pad left behind. So now I'm really left in a conundrum. And so she looks back at me and she says, how confident are you? And so my voice got a little weaker, a little more crack really. And so I, I told her very confident. And so she looks back down at the patient and she looks back up at me and she says, if I open this patient back up and you're wrong, I will call the Dean of your medical school and have you thrown out. And so she's laid down this threat, which for all the world seems completely viable and challenges me to maybe say, well, no, it's, it's okay. It can keep closing things back up. So she slowly just starts opening this patient back up and removing these stitches. And it seems like every time she pulls out a stitch, she looks back up at me, like allowing me to sort of reconsider this decision or reconsider this votive to say, no, I think you left a lap pad behind. And so she finally asks where she, uh, where do I think that she left this pad? And I tell her that it was, it was in the left side, like back behind the, the uterus. And so she finally undoes the last suture and reaches back down to the patient. And you can see her kind of fishing around and then her eyes get big and she slowly removes her hands and there's that sponge. Now in that moment for me, I can't tell you how relieved I was because I think it just felt as though I wasn't going to be kicked out of medical school. I think the thing about it afterwards and in contemplating this in uh, a more comprehensive way is that we did the right thing for the patient, but that physician never said anything to me. And the, the operating room nurse never said anything to me. No one thanked me for speaking up. Nobody said anything. And I think the importance and the reason why I tell this story is that I, th I think it's influenced how I've practiced down the road. And I just consider what would have happened if I would have been wrong. And the approach this surgeon could have taken is to have just embraced this as a moment of patient care and uh, considering how this would have influenced the quality of care and could have just thanked me for saying, well, I really appreciate you mentioning that and talked, I think, in that moment, even briefly, about how we were going to game plan this for going back and assessing whether this patient had a retained lap pad or not, rather than laying down this threat against my career. But she laid down this threat, and if I would have been wrong, I'm not sure I would have felt comfortable speaking up ever again in any setting, whether it was for the safety of a patient or whether it was on the behalf of my own learning. So I want to talk about then how this influences our learning climate that we create or that we practice within. And I think learning climate, just to define that as the concept to account for how the presence or absence of inequalities and civility are augments or hinders our learning. How does that presence of creating equality and maintaining that civility really help our learning or hinder that? And I think for a lot of physicians, they just envision the idea of medical learning being this like crucible of education, that it builds grit and it builds resiliency and it really helps us learn. But we know that the data reflects that that's not true at all. That we know that when there are high stress environments or when there's a culture of fear, that it really doesn't allow us to perform at our best. And for very menial tasks, simple tasks, you know, when that stress level is quite high, you know, it can increase focused attention and uh, there can be some fear conditioning to learn a very res uh, learned re response or conditioned response. But for something that's more complex, it really results in this divided attention and uh, very inattentive memory. And we can't commit these really important concepts that we need to learn about to memory to carry with us for the rest of our time in practice. And Edmondson even talks about the impact of psychological safety on learning. And she mentions that the research in neuroscience that shows that fear consumes physiologic resources, diverting them from parts of the brain that manage working memory and that processes new information. We know that if we are practicing in this way or that if we're creating this environment or at least not stopping that fear from taking place, that can really impair our own ability to practice and to retain that key information that we've encoded uh, and to try to consolidate that information, but is terribly detrimental for our learners. 
And without psychological safety, there's a few outcomes that we have to be mindful of. I think it starts with this idea of fear of judgment and humiliation or reprisal. If we don't have that fundamental culture of psychological safety, we start developing that fear. And that fear can lead to a feeling of incompetence. That feeling of incompetence can lead to a loss of worth. And then eventually that can lead to academic and social withdrawal. And worst of all, I think those consequences learn, uh, lead to worse clinical outcomes, to burnout and depression and a physician suicide. And we see this, and unfortunately we saw this in uh, my prior program where I was out, we lost a resident uh, because of a lot of these progressive features that led to, I think, uh, burnout and depression, but that was underpinned by some uh, a, I guess, unsafe culture that promoted or was void, I suppose, of psychological safety and, and promoted tenants that were antithetical to psychological safety. And I think it's important, too, to keep in mind how some of these principles are true for the other people that we work with, for nurses and for respiratory therapists or for care techs. They go through some of these same feelings and machinations, those feelings of incompetence, loss of worth, withdrawal from uh, their care in clinical practice. And so it's important to understand how this not only impacts us, but it can impact those around us as well if we're not the ones who are promoting these climates. So we must be the catalyst of change to avoid, I think, passively invoking the errors of our past. And so that's key for us to consider. How do we act as these catalysts to avoid invoking these errors of our past? So I wanna talk about these three tool sets to try to create the uh, safety and culture that's favorable to these micro and macro climates that we exist in. And so those three things are really gonna be based around setting clear expectations, using feedback as a means to reveal truth, and then trying to increase the psychological size of those around you. And for some of us also decreasing our psychological size as well. So let's start with expectations. So I think it's important to just understand that number one, medicine is high consequence uh, and very mistake prone. And we know that we make errors and we know that we probably make errors that we miss every day. It's just the magnitude of those errors may be very small or we might find that the magnitude down the road is quite large. But we also understand that we very much thrive through collaboration. And so I think we need to embrace this idea of failing faster to succeed sooner. And so the way that I try to envision this dynamic between the teacher and the learner is to try to create that expectation up front. So when I meet with my residents or I meet with my learners, my medical students, or even sometimes just shadowing medical students, I try to tell everyone that I'm just going to try to own our fallibility, that we know that we're going to make these mistakes, but it's really important that we try to create a safety net amongst all of us, that we can call those mistakes out or take some moments to create that safety to say, are we doing the right thing for the patient? I always try to open up to our time together by soliciting feedback. Hey, I'm going to want your feedback. And these are the areas that I'm going to want your feedback on. And if there's anything else you think uh, that you need to give feedback to me on, please do. And I will pause each day, uh, usually after rounds or at the end of the day to say, what should we have done better? Was there anything that we missed? And whether this is about a learning principle or something we could have done for a patient. And by asking those questions again and again, it starts creating that idea that we want to make sure that we're identifying those ways in which maybe I'm not meeting my learner's needs or where we could have done something different for our patients. I think this also helps establish that professional benchmark for saying this is how we want to practice in medicine. We want to be the ones that are very comfortable with what we do know and what we don't know. We're comfortable with the idea that as best as we might try, there might be some mistakes uh, or errors that we might try to make or that we do make, I shouldn't say try, but that we make uh, unintentionally, but that we wanna be aware of those. And for the learner, I think the incumbent responsibilities for them is to try to create that shared environment of responsibility. And so I really try to empower them to use the idea of a timeout, which is just to say, they know when they're working with me, Dr. Rush, can I just take a timeout? because I don't understand this, or I thought I'd seen the note from infectious disease that said we should be doing this instead. There's a moment we're in, the learner knows that if they use the word timeout, it's safe, it's judgment free, and they have the ability to ask any question. Doesn't matter whether they wanna go back and uh, they wanna recount um, why we selected a certain antibiotic, or they wanna talk about uh, basic physiology uh, and hepatorenal syndrome, whatever it might be, 
they can use that timeout as a way of just asking, uh, I need some clarity on this and I wanna understand this better before we go any further. I think that creates a cycle of psychological safety because you create that safety to speak up it leads to more rapid error or problem identification that can lead to process change and that reinforces the idea to identify other problems. And I think in the learning setting, this looks like this, which is that it's okay to not know the answer. I try to tell my residents and my, my medical students this all the time. I don't expect you to know, and it's okay not to know the answer. That's why you're here and that's why you're getting ready to learn. I'm gonna help you find your learning edge. I really try to preface with my medical students that I'm gonna to try to walk them up to the point where they don't know something about some concept. And that's the point where I get to start augmenting their knowledge. And that's what I wanna to try to find. And then when we get there, we try to take a moment to say, let's learn about this together. Let's create an open opportunity to have a dialogue, to teach on this. This is more about just having that learner maybe go out and grab an article and come back and teach you, but let's talk about this together. And we do that so that we can uh, then lead to the question of what else can we discover together? So we do this to build this cycle and we do this to build the cycle within uh, medical learning so that you are more comfortable asking the questions of your faculty or that the medical students are more comfortable asking you these questions so that we can continue to learn and to teach respectively. Number two is using feedback to highlight difficult truths. And Edmondson in her literature and in her book, she talks about this idea as being candor, which is really forthrightness. And it's the idea that we should feel the ability to speak up. Now, when I think about feedback, and feedback is something that I teach about both here and taught about in my time in New Mexico, I think feedback is constituted by uh, six sort of fundamental principles, and there's a seventh as well. Number one is just the timeliness to the feedback, and it's making sure that you give that feedback in uh, a manner wherein it is memorable so that both parties can think about uh, that moment in question. It is always objective. Feedback is intended to be observation based rather than uh, based on perceptions or interpretations of behavior. Similarly, it should be very specific. What exactly was seen uh, and what took place? It should be planned in some fashion, which is to say that uh, it should be, feedback should be given at a point where it is void sort of a personal emotion. Sometimes we get very invested in the idea of feedback and feedback as a means of reforming behavior, but it's important to make sure that it is void of that, uh, those personal emotions, especially if it's high stakes. It needs to be relevant to the learner. Uh, it needs to be relevant to what they're trying to learn and it needs to, uh, I think, enforce or reform some behavior that they have demonstrated. And it needs to be balanced as well. And I bring up the balanced concept because I think so often when we think about feedback and there's some people who've uh, tried to rename feedback as feed forward, balanced feedback is really about feedback either being reinforcing or reforming. And when I talk about feedback uh, to, to faculty and when you talk about this at national conferences, I try to remind people that feedback in the most fundamental basic form is like your hand touching a hot stove. That is reforming feedback. It hurts and there's a biologic stimuli of feedback that you get that tells your brain, don't ever put your hand on that hot stove ever again. Similarly, though, there is reinforcing feedback, which is when you do something well or do something correctly, you want to make sure that is identified. And so these elements of feedback, combined with the idea of never making it personal, are really key to create a culture of psychological safety. And I would just keep that in mind that the idea of candor in, in this manner is intended to just reveal truth, no matter how painful, but to help growth and, to, again, help us fail faster to succeed sooner. I wanna pause here real quick before we get to the third concept uh, and just see if there's any questions thus far on trying to establish expectations, which are uh, fundamental to feedback as well, or about the idea of feedback to sometimes highlight difficult truths to build a culture of psychological safety. Uh, I have a question, uh, this is Nate. I have a question about the, uh, the objectivity piece of it. Um, I, uh, because I both um, see the merit of that as, as the ideal we should be striving for, but also recognize our limitations never getting there and, and wonder if, if we um, may also do some damage along the way by pretending that we are 
being objective and our ability to observe or describe the situation, um, especially when it's not something as quantifiable as the number of sponges in the patient's uh, abdomen. Yeah. And more about observing an interpersonal uh, interaction or, or something of that nature and, and whether there's a role for, rather than striving for total objectivity, sort of acknowledging our the, the place we're coming from in, in um, describing that interaction or, or giving the feedback. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I'm going to see if I can touch on this, Nate. So let me know if uh, if if this addresses it or not. So when you used to teach feedback, it used to do used to use the the Rudolph model, which was uh, it there was a paper published in about 2008 in the anesthesia literature, and it was called debriefing with good judgment. And we talk about feedback with good judgment, which is about making an observation, uh, advocating, and then inquiring. And so the observation might be. You know, Justin, over the course of your grand rounds, I noticed that you spoke with your hands a lot, uh, and I found that uh, at times interruptive because of, but I'm curious what your frame was. Uh, so you make an observation of just the exact behavior that you saw. You can advocate for a best practice. But then I think behind that, Nate, more the intention is to ask uh, the person on the other side uh, their awareness or their frame about that. Um, and so we use that model to do two things. Uh, and what I've found successful with that model is that in inviting the perspective from that other party, uh, they might have a reason for doing something that you were not aware of. Um, similarly, they might have had a reason for what they did uh, in that particular setting. And I try to keep in mind when I try to think about feedback, and I suppose the idea of objectivity is that the objective truth that you see can be very different from the objective truth that I see. Uh, and so in that setting, in the simplest metaphor, is if I held up a can of Coke, and I was holding up to you all, and I'm looking at that can of Coke, I might just see the Coca-Cola logo on the front. And you might only see the nutrition facts label on the back. Now, I can describe to you exactly what I'm seeing, and I, I can tell you, well, this is a can of Coke. I'm telling you it's a can of Coca-Cola, and I can tell you that because I see the logo. And you could argue it's not because I can't see the label. All I see are nutrition facts. That's just a can with nutrition facts on it. We would both be right, and we're both identifying an objective truth. And so we use this more as a means to understand that two people can observe the same exact facts, uh, and they could observe different facts at the same time, but they can contextualize those in a different way. And so I rely on that objectivity to only reveal my frame but I depend on that other side of that other person to reveal their objective frame as well. Um, so I'm not sure if that, uh, if that uh, quite addresses your point. The intention is to understand that there can be multiple objective facts that we put certain weight into that we just may not have perceived or just may not have had the ability to see in that moment. Does that address it to some extent, Nate? Yeah, thank you. That might have been a much longer answer than you wanted, so I apologize. That's okay, thank you. All right, we have another question in the room, Dr. Zell. Oh, yep. Hey, Justin, Mike Bell. Um, I'm so happy you brought up the stove example. Um, and I don't mean to diminish the power of your message because you're, the example you painted of your first day of third year is so powerful uh, and it absolutely gets in the way. Um, but I think there, there there's a corollary to my dad, who often had an angry tone of voice, and I, I learned pretty quickly as a kid that his tone of voice didn't necessarily match the severity of my transgression. Um, contrasted to my mother, who everything was wonderful, oh, you did your best, even if you knew you were a florid failure, and then I lived in the gap between a compliment from my dad meant the world, a compliment from my mother meant nothing because her expectations were we were breathing in and out and therefore we were wonderful children. <laughs> and what I think would have been safer for me was honestly, if I'm about to touch the stove, somebody screams their full head off at me and I know that tone of voice is reserved for something really, really bad. And in fact, it will prevent me from making that awful mistake. So if they're not using that tone, here's my uncertainty playground. When things get appropriately tense, no one's going to let me walk out of bounds. I think sometimes the, oh, it's okay, do your best, it's okay if you make a mistake, is not actually always true. 
Yeah, I, and I think it is more about, so Mike, I think this is a great point. And I think to come back, the more the idea, and I think the context to envision this in is that we just have to recognize that we are going to make those mistakes. And it's about the idea of granting uh, the knowledge to one another that we will make those. And how do we do our best to your point to prevent one another from making those ahead of time? But if we make those mistakes, how are we able to come back and debrief on those afterwards? And I think that gets to a bit of the point that, you, uh, that you're bringing up. You also, I think, highlight very importantly, though, also the just the idea of uh, coming back to uh, the expectations, which part of this is expectation based as well and trying to establish those expectations earlier on to try to create those moments of safety. And sometimes it just it uh, if you establish the expectation ahead of time that that stove is going to be hot, that might mitigate that uh, that moment that you do so. Uh, but that also can start to establish that stage of uh what the climate will be as far as what you consider uh safe i guess or psychological safety in that moment but i think to be clear and to dr dell's point i think there is uh the takeaway from that idea uh of uh it being okay to make mistakes is that we will make those we just have to understand how to best identify those and debrief about those in a simple way is that Mike, does that all sort of affirm your point as well, I suppose? Uh, I can sign off on everything you just said. Yes. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, one of the last concepts and one of the last principles, which is just increasing the psychological size of those around you and decreasing your psychological size. So when I'm with trainees uh, and when I'm with, I'd even say in particular, sometimes with I'm with medical students who are just shadowing with me, I really try to make sure that I use preferred names and pronouns frequently, particularly with my house staff, uh, with my medical students, I really try to use their name, their title in front of patients and families. And I introduce them first to try to give them primacy and care. I position them at the right hand side of the patient or uh, at least at the patient's preferred side. Like I want that person to be identified as the primary individual to go to for that person's, uh, that patient's care. And I try to do that because I really wanna to try to make sure that uh, I don't diminish that opportunity for the learner to own that moment uh, with that patient. Now, there are obviously moments when, uh, as a faculty member, we sometimes have to step in and we have to, uh, I don't wanna say take away that primacy, but make sure that we identify our own roles. But I'll be candid, a lot of times I feel great if I get to go in, I get to see my patients and they ask primarily about the student or the resident. because so that really tells me that that learner is owning that patient care. And so I really try to make sure that I do that because I also want that trainee to feel valued in that moment as well. I think it's key to try to listen with conviction. And so, and again, embracing the idea that Edmondson brings up of being a don't knower. Uh, and so even when you believe that you know something, try to uh, to conjure the idea that, you know, you may not and try to listen intently. And this can go along with medical principles. This can even just be about trying to understand more about the life that our students and our residents live outside the hospital. And that leads into the idea of listen or develop meaningful rapport, listening as a don't know or and develop meaningful rapport about appreciating the life sometimes external to the clinical environment asking what's important to those that we work with, uh, what's not uh, important to you. And so I just bring this up because we're trying to invest ourselves in those that we're training as part of a collaborative team. And so I really try to make sure that when I start on service, uh, I usually like to ask sometimes a fun set of questions of my students or my house staff, like uh, what was what drove you to be passionate enough to, to pursue medicine? If there was, uh, one career that you could have, anything in the world that you could do other than medicine, if you didn't have the privilege of being a physician, what would it be? And I'll ask for another random fact about them. And it just starts establishing that rapport and at least the ability to feel like we can communicate as two humans or getting to know one another before we just dive right into the clinical medicine. And that can be key. And I'd advocate that you consider doing that throughout your time together with your house staff or with your medical students. I think it's also key to decrease your size. And so I think in less formal settings, using first names, if you feel comfortable, can be key. 
I personally favor self-deprecation and sharing anecdotes of training experiences. And so I will definitely humanize myself with uh, my medical students uh, during a, uh, a moment of whiteboard teaching or sometimes when we're chatting about uh, patient care uh, and just sitting down and, and going through maybe before we're chart rounding or doing something else. But in those down moments away from patients, I'll really try to make sure that I humanize myself as much as possible. The reason being is that a lot of those humanizing experiences are gonna be shared with our learners. And I think when I think back to how it was as a medical student, I just saw my attendings as being these unassailable figures who had all this knowledge and somehow seemed like they'd just been birthed as a, uh, as a gifted physician and attending physician at that point in time. And in reality, we've all gone through these sometimes harrowing experiences that have sharpened who we are as clinicians. And so I think it'd be important to share those anecdotes of training experiences. And uh, these are just uh, some images back when I was a medical student. This is uh, my best friend and my best colleague back in New Mexico. But we used to talk about these moments a ton with our medical students uh, and really would try to do that to build this meaningful rapport. I was a block chair uh, and, at UNM, and it was so key for me to develop those humanizing uh, or share those humanizing moments with my, my medical students because it just made them much more willing uh, to receive whatever it was that I had to teach them. And so I think this can be key as well. One other thing that I'll just emphasize, and again, if you feel comfortable, is that I really try to use my first name with nurses up here. Um, and so it depends on the culture that's present, but what I know is that the nurses who know me on a first name basis as Justin, uh, are the ones that I have great rapport with. They really know uh, when to contact me if something is really going down. They have no qualms about contacting me. They're not afraid that they're going to get yelled at or if they're just concerned that the patient has, uh, you know, maybe a new uh, facial droop and they're contemplating whether they should call the stroke alert or not. Sometimes nurses tell me, um, and as chair of our quality committee up here too, sometimes they're stymied from doing so because they're afraid of the reprisals they're going to receive from some other physicians. And so I try to establish that culture, at least with me, and I try to promote with my colleagues up here that, you know, at least in those less formal settings, when we're away from the bedside, that we get to know each other on a first name basis. And that makes it much easier for some of these nurses to make sure that they're uh, involving us in changes with the patient and actually delivering pa better patient care. And there's some literature behind this notion as well. And so it can be hard, but I just advocate that you consider doing it if you feel comfortable enough doing so. All told, the idea of establishing clear expectations to create accountability, um, trying to use better feedback to promote dialogue, and then sometimes modifying psychological size particularly in settings where you can with learners can really facilitate better understanding and all of that can lead to change. Fundamentally, we know that experiencing psychological safety at work means that you feel comfortable making yourself vulnerable in front of people you see every day and vulnerability for most people is absolutely terrifying. And I just bring this up to try to again, emphasize that this can be something hard to do, but this can be something that uh, can really lead to better learner outcomes, better patient outcomes, from some quality perspectives as well. And while this is terrifying, it's absolutely, necessi absolutely a necessity for us to pursue in medical education. So just some uh, key objectives to review, and then I just wanna invite any more dialogue or questions you guys have, is that psychological safety for all of us is really that freedom to be fallible, understanding that we're not promoting this idea that it's okay for us to be mediocre, but understanding that we will make mistakes, but just understanding that we need to build that support to succeed. It is uh, important to understand that there is a cycle that can reinforce the idea that we drive forward learning or drive forward quality improvement through that safety to speak up, identifying errors to fail faster, to change sooner, so that we can achieve that process change and then reinforce those needs to identify problems. And then there are multiple tools we can use to try to create psychological safety in different climates. So with that, I'll just take questions from the audience as uh, as well and uh, try to tackle what I can with you guys here in the remaining time. Thank you so much, Dr. Roche. At this time, we'll open it up to questions from the audience here either in person or feel free to um, type in the chat. Um, CME code is also in the chat as well. All right. 
Hey, this kid again. Thanks for a for a great talk. Um, I, um, I I guess more just a, a comment or a point about this is something I really appreciated um, in this idea of you know increasing the psychological side of those around you, which I, I think you know I heard kind of being weaved in through all of those strategies. Really um, helps to get at the uh, I think the common idea that establishing psychological safety necessarily means setting lower expectations, and I think that. That very nicely highlights that the setting of higher expectations can go very directly hand in hand with establishing psychological safety. That by promoting the people around you, for asking them questions for their honest feedback, not not asking questions to uh, find find out the limits of their knowledge and establish your intellectual dominance, but to uh, genuinely get their input because you respect their ability to, to see things you don't, promotes the the, the level of the, the learner of the whole team and. But also can establish that climate of safety, and not only why it's it's uh, completely easier, straightforward to do. But I think I, I really like that uh, concept and appreciate that. Yeah, and I I wouldn't even don't have anything much more to add to that. But that's exactly the intent: is establish that expectation, but establishing it as a high expectation, uh, but also putting primacy on that learner as well, so they understand that is a shared expectation, striving towards uh, a high standard. What other questions or thoughts do you have, even if it's anything to the contrary? Hi, I'm Krista. I'm one of the three residents. Um, I am trying to get better about listening to that from my medical students and even like my interns right now, too. Um, but I still find either I'm the best resident ever, or they still like, I feel like despite what seems to be an uncomfortable work environment, those kids might still not be like providing me feedback. Um, how do you kind of like, um, best initiate like i know it's best to have like that plan time set aside to ask for that feedback but how have you found to be most successful um to like elicit that like honest and like constructive feedback from them <laughs> other than just creating a positive environment we talked about I, chris i think that's a great question i missed some of it but i'm gonna summarize it and please tell me if this is basically right is that how do you elicit and try to get what you feel to be earnest feedback uh, when sometimes uh, feedback is generally polarized as everything's great, nothing to change, or uh, much less uh, frequently, uh, everything needs to change, we're, we're terrible. But is it basically about how do we get that earnest feedback about some specific elements? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I think, so I think that begins with number one, thinking about the uh, specific areas you might want feedback on. Um, and so we sometimes talk about in, in the feedback literature, feedback not only being about um, identifying blind spots, things that we're doing well, uh, or things that we may not be doing well, but that we have no idea of, that's a blind spot that we can't see. But what I sometimes what I tell people is when they're trying to seek this to avoid just that generalization, I will ask about feedback about something specific. Uh, and sometimes I will ask, and this can feel tough from a character perspective, but I will ask about uh, if there was one thing I could change or do differently, what would they recommend? So uh, I will tell you that Whenever I finish a, uh, a learning session with the medical students, I will ask them if there's one thing you think I could do differently, what would it be? Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to incorporate every piece of feedback they have for me because they might say, well, I, I, I've had students say, well, you should, you should completely change everything about your, uh, about your presentation. I'm like, well, that doesn't drive with adult learning theory. But I bring that up because number one, it validates the people who are giving the perspectives. And number two, it lets them know that you're availing yourself to reforming feedback sometimes. And so if you're still getting, well, I, I don't know, it's hard because I really found X uh, to be beneficial, or if they're having difficulty highlighting areas of reforming feedback, then you can fall back to the perspective of, well, if it's hard to find areas of reforming feedback, what made this uh, X so good for you or so helpful for you. And if they then tell you uh, that, oh, it was the way that you went to the whiteboard and drew up the uh, the nephron and then went through like the ascending loop. And uh, I just really found that super helpful to show me where sodium was reabsorbed. And then you get a better idea of, well, maybe I'm really doing these things well. And uh, these are the key ways in which I need to continue doing these things well. So 
ask for specific feedback, but ask if there are any things that they would have changed or they found difficult. And if you're not getting that, then come back and hinge on the positive of what they really then found to be very helpful about what it was that you were doing. Also ask for that feedback repeatedly. So establish some feedback or some goals up front that you're going to be asking them for feedback on day one. And then make sure that you revisit that like on day three or day seven as well, because that gives the learner time uh, to be in your presence and really think about this. So does that help answer your question? I would say that Literature would su suggest that, and I found that beneficial, but does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Was that too general? No, that was great, thank you. Okay. All right, anything else? I've been sharing with you all as well. All right, well, let's give another round of applause for Dr. Rawls. Thank you for coming on right. Yeah, thank you again, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Um, and uh, again, if there are any questions, I'm sorry, I didn't list my email, but uh, if you, uh, uh, I think, give it to either Angeline or uh, or Dr. Stehauser, they can get in contact with me as well and be happy to carry on for the dialogue. But I really appreciate you guys having me today. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right, guys. Take care.